for this Joanne. Thank you all for um, just your love and the condolences that I've been receiving um, this week. Um, I'm just I'm gonna go ahead and open us up in prayer because uh, this word uh, is it, is a lot in in this word, um, and I want to be able to you know share as much as possible within the time I've been given. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just love you, O Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for this day, Father. We thank you, O God, for your faithfulness to us, Lord God. We know, God, that if we are here, O God, on this side, O God, of the living, Lord God, we know, Lord God, it is because, Lord God, that you are not finished with us yet, Lord God, that you still, O God, have a plan and a purpose for us, Lord God. So on this morning, Lord God, we give you honor and we give you praise, Lord God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, Hallelujah, Lord God. As I prepare, Lord God, to deliver your word to your people, Lord God, I pray, Father, that you will prepare their hearts, Lord God, and their minds, Lord God, to receive, oh God, the seed of your word, Lord God, in good ground, Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that as I surrender unto you, oh God, as I decrease, oh God, and you increase, Lord God, that the word of that the spirit of truth, Lord God, will be within me, Lord God. And in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I rebuke any error, Lord God any um any false doctrine lord god in the name of jesus lord god and i declare and decree father hallelujah lord god that the every word that i speak on today lord god will be oh god in alignment lord god with you oh god with your word lord god with your principles lord god and with your truth oh god and we just thank you and we bless you in jesus name oh god amen 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 <laughs> um so as uh Prophet says she she um gave me this assignment last Monday and uh immediately I knew exactly um what uh I was gonna bring to you you guys because the Lord had been placing it on my heart. Um but I didn't know like okay when this this word would be would be needed. And so when she called my name, I I already knew. And and so I want to talk to you all today um, about faith in the hard times. <laughs> um, and so we know that right now we can attest that we if if not on a personal level, even but on a nation on a nationwide level, that we are seeing hard times all around us. And so how do you maintain your faith during hard times? I want to start out with just um, a couple of definitions um, of faith. Yes, we, you know, we we probably have a good idea of it, but I always like to just kind of refresh our our memory, refresh our um our thinking. And so, faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. It is a belief that leads to action. It is an act of trust in God, a belief that in what He says is true that results in action. And we know the Bible defines faith as uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that is in Hebrews 11 and 1. And on this morning, I'm going I'm to give you guys the scriptures, but I'm not going to like read through them because it, it's a lot of them. Um, but I, I do want you all to go back and, and study. However, I will I will walk you through in, in a way of a paraphrase um, as I am breaking down, breaking down this word, uh, because the Lord showed me that he showed me a couple, a couple of women in the Bible who displayed faith through some hard times. And not only did he show me that, but he also revealed the strategy that they used. And so if you are taking notes, you or if you're not taking notes, you may want to, so that not only um, do you hear the word, but you also can uh, receive and record the strategy. And so the first, um, the first woman that I want to highlight uh, that had faith during the hard times is um, Elijah and the widow woman. And that's found in 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24, that story. And I want to just kind of like set it, set up the scene just a little bit, give you a little bit of, of a backstory before we jump all the way in. Okay, so in um, 1 Kings 17, we are looking at a time where Elijah had just not long before declared a drought in the land. And we know that a drought is a prolonged period of uh abnormally low rainfall that results in a shortage of water. And so we know that when there's a shortage of shortage of water, a, that a famine is sure to follow because water sustains life. 
And not only not only does it sustain uh, life in our plant life and our vegetation, um, but it, but it also it also sustains us, which is why our body is made up of what what is it seventy eight percent water. Um, and so when there is no life, there is famine. There is a almost a a um, kind of like a season of death, like you can see death all around you. And so Elijah, he was hiding by a brook called Sherith where God sent him and provided for him through that brook and, and some ravens until he caused the brook to dry up. And it was then when the brook dried up, the brook dried up that the Lord told him to go to Zarephath where he had commanded a widow to provide for him. And so as he, when he got to that, um, to Zarephath, the first thing that I want to point out is that the woman was there exactly as God said. And so being that the woman was there and God said that he had commanded this widow to provide for Elijah, that, that right there signifies that this woman must have had a relationship with God. She was able to recognize the voice of God and be in the right place at the right time, doing exactly what it is he told her to do. And so the first thing that we could gain from that is to cultivate a relationship with God so that you can maintain faith in the hard times. Because knowing the voice of God could be the difference between life or death for you. And in this case, this is exactly what it was for this woman, although she was sent or, or positioned, I should say, to provide for the prophet Elijah. And so let's look at this. It, it, we look at it, verse 12. This woman, she was down to her last. She had no money. She had no food. She had no hope. She had nothing left to lose but her life, <laughs> her and her son's life. That's all she had left to lose. And God asked her to risk it all. She didn't know that at the time. But when Elijah came to her and and he asked her, um, as she was getting water, he asked her, you know, not only to give him some water, but also go and make him a cake. And, and, and she explained to him, hey, I, you know, I only have a handful, enough for me and my son. I'm actually going home to prepare this so that we could eat it and die. But Elijah gave her the word of, a, of the Lord, which contained it, pretty much contained a promise. And so he asked her pretty much to invest in him. By the word that the Lord had given him. So that again, that took a relationship. I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to say that it kind of it had to bear record in her spirit for her to even agree to that, knowing that that was her last. But despite the fact of her lack, she chose to trust God and the one he sent. And so I want to ask this morning, what area of your life is God demanding more from you, yet you're too focused on what you, what you perceive as lack to obey him? Her trust and obedience, even when it looked as if all was lost, unlocked the door to overflow and abundance in her life. And we see that in verse 15 and 16. I hear God saying that I want to bless you, but do you believe that I will? And I'm talking to you guys here on the prayer line. I want to bless you, but do you believe that I will? You know that he can, but do you believe that he will? He did it for the widow of Zarephath during hard times. And I question, I question our belief this morning because John 1, 7 and 8, you know, calls those that ask and doubt God double minded. And it goes on to say that we won't receive anything. Many of us, we won't admit or even or we haven't even looked, you know, took the time to even examine the reason why sometimes we may struggle to trust God. And what I have come to understand in, from my own life is that my, my struggle to trust God, it was it was um, found laid in the disappointments of previously unanswered prayers. And when I looked a little bit closer and if we if we would look a little bit closer, a lot of the requests that we put before God was rooted in unbelief. And if we know nothing else, we know that the word of God is true. 
And, and, and if, if, if we are asking, we're believing on one hand, but in, but, but in the back of our mind, in our heart, we are, are, are filled with unbelief. It said we won't receive anything. <clears throat> so we must make up our mind like the widow of Zarephath, that we will trust God even when things don't look as if it's going in our favor. And so if we continue reading through that story, we will see that not only did God provide in abundance and, and fulfill the word of Elijah, but at some point after that, tragedy struck. What she loved the most, her son, he died. Even after she had sacrificed her last, she sacrificed, she was blessed. And I can imagine her looking like, God, that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough for, for you to continue to preserve me. That wasn't enough for you to continue to allow my son to live. God, hadn't I showed you my faithfulness by trusting and obeying you? <laughs> have you ever, have you ever been in a position where it felt like your sacrifice just wasn't enough? Because many of us, Many of us, we give up when our sacrifice doesn't yield the expected harvest in the time we expected it. But I want, to, I want to encourage you to not let what you see cause you to doubt that God is both willing and able to bless you. Because if he delivered, if God delivered before, he can do it again. He saved the widow and her son from certain death in the midst of a drought Surely he can do it again and more. So when we go and we, we look, we get down to like verse 21. When Elijah, he, he, she, you know, she went to him like my, my son, you know, he's dead. Elijah went in and he went to, he went to the woman's home and, and Elijah, we see that he, you know, he, he laid on the boy three times praying. He prayed and laid, prayed and laid three times. Crying out to God. Mm. Sometimes we have to persist, be persistent in prayer. Because <laughs> even if, if we look at Jesus, <laughs> we, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, how many times did he ask, he pray and ask the Lord to let this cup pass me? God, like, do I, do, do I really have to do this? Um, how many times did he pray? Did he go off and pray? And so what I, want to, what I want to say is how you respond during the hard times is a testament to where your faith lies. So Elijah, again, I said he prayed three times for the boy. And finally, finally, the Lord calls the breath of life to reenter this, this boy. And so, like the woman, this, this widow, of course, you know, like many of us would have done, she panicked, she panicked, she panicked. But when she saw, she saw the miracle that was performed, it was then that she praised. And she, when I say she praised, she acknowledged God and, and she acknowledged the God in Elijah she acknowledged, when you acknowledge God, that is a form of praise. And so, even though our humanity may kick in and at first we may panic, we may, we may crumble, we may cry, it's not, don't, don't let yourself remain in that place. Stand up in praise. Come to yourself and stand up in praise. And so if you did not catch the, the, the strategy in that, I want to go and, and recap it really, really quickly. So the first thing you want to do is cultivate a relationship with God. That's the first strategy. The second one is you want to agree with God. The third one, you want to obey God, because you can agree with God and not obey. 
We know God is was good. We know what the word says, but there's a lot of times that we don't show our agreement in our actions. And, it, and, and the definition of faith, it says that it results in action. It's truth that results in action. And, and, the, and lastly, we want to persist in prayer. If we, if, if we have faith and we believe in what God said, then we are going to continue to pray until what we believe, till we see what we believe. All right, so I got a little bit of time. So let me, I'm going to give you this last, this last one, this last example of another woman who had faith in hard times. And this woman here, <clears throat> Um, man, this woman here, it, it, she's encouraging to me where I am right now. Um, and this one here is Elisha and the Shunammite woman um, in 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37. You'll find that story. And the Shunammite woman, she was described as a prominent woman. So she was well off. She was the pretty much the direct opposite of the widow. She was... Um, a woman who was established and well respected, and she was married. Her husband, her husband was alive. Now they did not have any children. Where they didn't have a son. I don't know if they had daughters. They didn't mention daughters, but they didn't have a son. And so, uh, so, but even in that, this woman was content in where she was. She she didn't have any lack um, from what the word says. And so, um, she she. Um, this woman was pretty much, she was living uh, and, and loving and serving God and uh, living a life of faith. And she demonstrated her faith, demonstrated her faith um, in God by making provision for Elisha whenever he and his service would come into town. And so, so much so that she had, um, she, she went to her husband and had him build a, a special guest room just for him. And, and when he would come into town, he would have somewhere to stay and they would provide them with meals. And, and she did that based on her faith with God because this woman belonged to the tribe of Issachar. So she was a part, of, she was a member of the, the, the children of Israel. Okay, she was a part of, of, that, of those tribes. And so Elisha, he wanted to repay her. At some point he was like, you know, I want to repay this, this woman's kindness. And so... He wanted to know, how can I bless, how can I bless you? So he had his servant ask at first. And then, you know, she was like, you know, I dwell amongst my own people. That was her way of saying that I, I don't lack anything. I don't have a need for anything. I am well taken care of. I am uh, content in where the Lord has me. And, and so the, uh, the servant said to him, he said, yeah, but you know what? She doesn't have a son. And so Elisha was like, you know what? He said, okay, call her here. Call her to me. And he said, he gave her the, he pretty much gave her the word of the Lord. You know, he, he prophesied to her that by this time next year, you will have born a son. And she, you know, was like, hey, don't like, don't, don't, don't play. Don't lie. Don't lie to me, man. Like, I, you know, her husband was old, older man. She was just like, I did, she didn't really think that it would happen for her for whatever reason it is. It doesn't really go into the details of why, but even in that, the word of the Lord came to pass. And by that time that Elisha, Elisha said she had, she had a son. And so not long after this, uh, you know, this baby was born, you know, um, we see again, tragedy struck the little boy. He ended up dying after complaining of a headache and he died in the lap of his mother. And immediately, instead of, of, of crumbling in grief, she was like, you know what? I got to go find this man of God. <laughs> I want to ask you guys, do you know that faith has its own language? And that part of our agreeing with God is that we say what he says. And so what you speak during Hard times can determine how you go through or grow through the hard times. Proverbs 18 and 21, it tells us that death and life are in the power of our tongue. And that those of us that love it will eat its fruit. And I believe that the Shunammite woman understood this and it showed in her responses. 
her son died and immediately she laid that baby in, in Elisha's bedroom that she had built for him. And she said, I need to go and find the man of God. And her husband, he, he asked why, but I, I noticed that she didn't say, you know, our baby, he, he died. He, he's not here. She didn't break down crying, anything at all. She said, it is well. <laughs> imagine, imagine that y'all imagine receiving a gift that you didn't ask for only for it to die before it reaches full potential. And, and, and your response is it is well. Our words, our words are seeds. So her it is well was a seed of life sown into the promise. She held on to that promise. Like my son, like you've given me a son and, and it's not for him to live. It's, I mean, not for him to die. It's for him to live. And so it is well. And so I'm going to continue to say it is well. And when you continue that it is well, after that first one, that all the other it is well that follow that was like the water needed to continue to nourish that seed. And so this was an urgent matter, but it did not change her declaration. It is well. And so I want to ask you, when all hell is breaking loose in your life, can you in faith say it is well? When the uh, diagnosis from the doctor uh, does it, it, it doesn't speak what the word of God says. It does, the diagnosis isn't, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, isn't, even as your soul prospers. Can you say it is well when you've been praying and believing and believing and praying, but nothing is seeming to move in your favor? Can you say it is well? If you find yourself feeling like Paul in Romans chapter seven, where he said, man, listen, like I want to do good, but the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, I continue to do it. But by the grace and mercy of God, can you say it as well? As prophet is shared with you guys, I am in the midst of a hard time <laughs> right now. And those of you who have ever preached or delivered a word know that the word comes to, to test and try you first. And I am right now in the midst of that hard time. Last Saturday, before Prophetess gave me this assignment, I got a phone call that my, my father, the only father that I've known all my life, had been diagnosed with, was diagnosed with stage four cancer, 56. And it was spread, it had spread everywhere, and there was nothing that they could do for him. They couldn't treat him because they were, they were worried that if they treated him, it would get worse. It would make things worse. And so that it, so when she gave me the assignment on Monday, immediately I already, like I said, I knew because I knew this word had been had been waiting, laying in wait for me to bring it, but I didn't know when or where or how. And do you not know that by Thursday he was gone? Not even a week, not even a week, he was gone. And so even in that. My confession today is it is well, as bad as it hurts, it is well. Having to, having to sit and, and write his obituary, it, it is well. Through the tears and the pain, it is well. It is well. Why? Because I trust in my God and I believe that uh, my faith my faith is communicated in my actions. It's communicated in my, in my speech. It is communicated in everything that I say that I believe. And so it is well. So again, the strategy found in, in what the Shunammite woman um, displayed is to maintain the language of faith in the face of hard times and to continue to persist in prayer god bless you guys that's all i have i'm turning it back over to you prophetess